Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, welcome to that here show, a story written by a current prisoner with your favorite journalist, Tony. We're going to go ahead and waste no time and dive right into this thing. Listen, if you guys can give me 500 likes, man, 500 likes, 500 of you guys, if you guys can hit that like button, I promise you guys I'll drop another video today. You know, yesterday was a double dropper. If you guys want another dropper today, I ain't even tripping. I'll go ahead and edit it and I'll drop it today. You know what I'm saying? Just go ahead and hit that like button. 500 likes, ladies and gentlemen. With that being said, real quick, before we dive into this interview, former Aryan, former Aryan Brotherhood member, man, it's a very juicy interview, and it's about to get very, very deep, man. So with that being said, you know, one time my family took me to Knott's Berry Farm. And if I'm not mistaken, man, there was a restaurant right by there. It was a Chinese spot, man, called the Busy Bee. Man, never once in my game did I ever see that restaurant again, but I've always been wanting to go back. Do they still exist, man? Because I've tried looking them up, and I cannot find one. And with that being said, man, where is some good Chinese food, man? Where? Man, let me know, man. Drop a comment section, man. One of your favorite spots that you've been to. I don't care what state you're at, what city you're at, man. Drop the comment, man. And if you're scrolling down the comments and you happen to see a spot that you've been to, hit that like on there, on their comment. So I can know, man. And I'll go ahead and scope some of these spots. And I'll go ahead and do a little review if you guys want me to. You know what I'm saying? With that being said, ladies and gentlemen, let's go ahead and dive right into this. So I was just, you know, having a little conversation with you guys. I was always wondering that. So that's why I asked my audience. With that being said... You guys have a great Friday. It's a beautiful day today. Make the best of it. Don't forget to smell the roses, man. Enjoy life. Let's go. Lewisburg, boom, and it's a special management unit. So the feds, like I said, remember there was 15 prisons, USPs, maxes. Like, hey, check it out. Don't get me wrong. Federal prison, oh, them lobster and that steak and carpet floors. Yeah, it's out there, but it's in the camps and the lows. They got tennis courts, they got all that shit, right? I heard, I see, you know, but, you know, if you're a gang member or you're with the business, homie, or you are you going to the max, all right? You go there, and there's PC, there's like two PC yards in the max, and it's like in Indiana, Arizona, Hutt, and Corda. Those are the dropout yards in the front. So, and so the fight, I hit dude, man. Bing, 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 from the whole... And there's a war between uh, the skinheads and the brand. So, the situation occurred at the same time as mine because they opened up Lewisburg over all this Victorville. My homeboy, I've seen he's not my homeboy, but he's, he's my, my homie. He's an ADX from sickness, Richard Blunt. He uh, was from uh, 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 Aryan Society. Or, yeah, ASB, Aryan Society Branch, Aryan Soldier Branch, that's right, from Oregon. It's an Oregon gang. So in Victorville, there was only like two two ASBs. Sickness got the whole Viking face, skull, I mean head, helmet, you know. And uh, and there's like 20 skinheads on that yard. But my homeboys, so there was like seven of us from the ride. And, uh, and as the, the order goes, the brand, the ride, and then it goes. But really, the ride, we do what we want because we could have whacked. Anyways, let me get off target. So, at the same time, the skinheads and the brand, this is 2008. Sickness, uh, I guess, was going to his cell and some Pisces was coming out. And so, Sickness drugged the Pisces and beat the Well, back then in Victorville, and this is why those fools are dead, you know, and I'll get to the snow and beast and all that, you know is because of the calls that they made. They made hella calls, calls because of the feds said, look, man, we're gonna, this is your, you know, this is your backyard. We're going to give you guys right outside of LA. We're giving you your own backyard, but here's the deal. And, you know, if we start having race riots and cops are getting stabbed and you got white dudes rolling out in body bags, and we're going to send you guys straight to ADX to the rock too. And so they were trying to kick back. Uh, them fools, right? And try to make them calls and look the other way, you know? And so if dudes got there, SIS would say, hey man, hey Mark, hey Terry, this dude just got out here on the bus, uh, can you come out? And so they would say, oh yeah, well, he's from Texas, he's a Texas AB, oh yeah, well if he comes out, we're gonna kill him, no. So they were making calls like that because they knew if they had, if, you know, calls that they should have been whacked and they didn't, you know, the day it would come back on them as the eyes on the yard, you know. So they would rather tell SIS low-key, yeah, don't let them out here, you know, and, you know, whack them. And it wasn't just them, you know. 
So, uh, sickness beats that dude up. And so one of the policies right there is you couldn't put your hands on another race without getting, you know, permission from the brand. You couldn't fucking stab nobody without permission from the brand. You couldn't do this or that without permission from the brand. So one of the things with the ride, me being a rider, was I did it twice right there. And even though I was, you know, was breaking the rules, I looked and said, what's up? Because when I stabbed that child, I came back to the yard. And, you know, they went and got me out. They, you know, they said, hey, man, you, you, that dude was a chum. We'll make sure homeboy comes back out. Mark did that. They did that. You know, I give him that. But so when I came back out to the window and says, hey, homeboy, big homies want you on the yard. And right there on those yards, you can see out onto the yard. You can't see outside the prison on like in the, you know, on the wheels, but you can see the yard in between buildings. So, uh, uh, I come out and so I, right then I was a youngster and these fools were calling me out to the table because they were mad and I'm not knowing and I just booked some chomo so I'm not but I almost got a knife to go out there because I didn't know and I see my homeboys arguing you know homeboy oh no and and you know, acts from the right they're arguing with them dudes so I'm like yeah we're gonna kick this. So I went out there, and brand dude says, hey, man, check this out. I told you to fuck that dude, man. Who gave you the order to do that? And I didn't say nothing, right? But I looked at my homeboy, and he says, check this out, man. What if it was, what if we were checking on that dude, right? And it came back that he was clean, and he wasn't, and somebody just smothered him up. Then what happens? You're going to be in a box, homeboy, for that. You don't know, move without nothing. We tell you when to say, well, check this out. Was the dude, what? Was he or wasn't he? He was, wasn't he? Right? And I got slick. And I said, barking at me like I did something wrong when I just booked some fool. You don't miss me. And so there was a big old, and so the main big homie, Mark, was like, nah, you're right. You, you did right, you know, but you, I did you whenever I did. And the ride did that too. We did what we wanted to do. We didn't care what the brand had to say. And they always had the books open to us because the homeboy gamer, he's the one that had the keys at the time. For the ride back then, you know, and they he always coming out of the ADX was, hey man, you know, there's 30 of you Nazi low riders who are open for you guys because over in the feds it wasn't at the time like the state, you everybody was slammed down, people weren't you know getting made that much, but the feds see the difference between is every morning at 6:30 they unlock your doors and everybody's out walking around. I can go to your cell everywhere. There's no, the the difference between the state and the feds, I like the state better because everybody's in the cell, but in ADX in Colorado, in the feds, you know, you got all the TVs around the day room. Now, you listen to the TVs through the radio because you, like, uh, you go to your TV, like, there's like 10 TVs in the day room, right? You got the Mexican, or the Pisces, Southsiders, Crip, Buzz, everybody's got their tables and their TVs. Well, on top of the TV, we'll say like 92.5. Bam, you put that on your radio, you can hear it. So that's how, you know, so I don't like that. You know, you ain't got no lamps and hot pots in the cell. You ain't got none of that. You know, so you eat packages. You don't got that. You got a good store, you know, but uh, conjugal visits, you ain't got that. Or when I left, you didn't. Um, so... Sickness and hits that dude, right? And all these prices go to the big homie on the yard at the time and tell, tell Mark Nyquist, look, man, your dude beat us up and beat my homeboy up, right? And so because he's drunk, he supposedly was in the wrong. And so later that day, Mark calls sickness out to the table. And when he goes out to the table, the first thing happens is sickness has a radio and his headphones in, right? And so right there at those tables on that yard, on a yard high profile, those MA brand, you know, BGA, whatever, those tables, you can't go up to them if you have a watch or a radio or headphones or any of that stuff, any kind of electronics. Because right, right there it's known there's been a couple of places where, you know, high profile dudes, cartel or whatever, that they've had setups where, you know, they went to the table to converse and Dudes had a wire in the watch. Some dude named Andy, some black dude, set some BG other dude up like that. You know, my homeboy Harry from the ride, he got 23 years 
for a controlled drug buy on the prison yard because the dude had a wire in his watch. So you got to watch it on high-profile yards like that, you know? So uh, sickness, walking out to the table, has the radio, and this dude to me, he's in the right, looking, hey, homeboy, you know, can't handle radio right here. So you kick him a rat, and he throws the radio way out in the air across the yard. That dude says, Mark says, you need to be disciplined for what you did, homeboy. And he says, man, I'm a skinhead. You ain't disciplined me, homeboy. And see, everybody said that at the time, all them different gangs behind the brand's back, you know? But nobody acted on it besides, you know, real money, you know? And so us, the ride, the certain yard caliber, but he was in the wrong, I guess, for beating that price up. So he said, hey, you know what? I'm skinhead. And that dude, Tim, he said, you don't want to talk to the brand like that. And sickness, boom, fired on him. Took off on him. And next thing you know, his whole yard kicked off. It was the white, you know, it was the skinhead, the state of Oregon. And you got to remember, skinheads, there was like 20 deep. And then you had all their alliances. And you had a skinhead uh, a gang called SAC. You know, they were from Utah. So you had all them. And it was against uh, about 200 whites that were all up under the brand. Because you had about four or 500 whites at the time on the yard. About 400. So every yard, dude, is going off. Boom, boom, boom. He's getting stabbed. Drugged down the sidewalk. Dude, Brandon from San Diego, they were kicking his head and dragging him down the sidewalk. His whole head was... <laughs> it was so funny. So anyways, they locked everybody up. And that's when they opened up Lewisburg special management unit it's 24 month program four phases six months the first phase and they made it brutal too man when we first showed up you couldn't have nothing for the first six months you had no property you just had a bible and the stuff they gave you and so you know if you're an animal and you mentally you know stable you know how to you know control you know your you know, anybody, you know, we know how to adapt to any kind of environment once you get, you know, adapting. So it didn't matter. But the fact that them feds were like, look, man, came out and told, you know, and right there you had every gang organization in the United States. You had NF, you had Zuz that ran that, you had Monster, uh, I mean, not Monster, Mad Dog and Spider Loco, Skip. And those were our worst enemies right there, was NF and Norteños, believe it or not, against California. Because, you know, not worst enemies, they were united with, with Texas right there. So the feds, when they opened up Lewisburg, sent us there, everybody went there. So when you get to Lewisburg first time, where everybody goes out to the yard, there must have been a hundred cages right there. And it was inmates, you know, and all the gangs, and all you see is fools working out. Boom, boom, boom. You had from the Blacks, Black Stones, Four Corner Hustlers, GDs, Vice Lords. You had, uh, oh, shit. you still there, Tony? I'm right here, bro. Hell yeah. Okay, all right. All right, all right. All right. You had Four Corner Hustlers. You had Black Stones. You had uh, Norteños, Sudanios. You had uh, Dirty White Boys. You had Texas. You had Tongo Blast, Aztecas. Uh, 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 Texas MA, you had, um, dude, you had, uh, Texas Syndicate. All those Texas Mexican gangs are united with the Norteños because the Norteños are fucking at war with the Serenos. So because of that war, just like back in the day between them two, the Norteños said, hey, man, the brand and the whites, because you guys run with the Emmett. Well, just like the war with Texas now, all those sex Mexican gangs were against the M.A., but now they say, you guys too. So N.F. is united with Texas, all them gangs, and then we're united with the M.A. Same thing. So the feds were like, you know what? I'm shutting it down. We can't build you guys more prisons because once two organizations go at it and we're at war, they put us in the same yard because it's on site. On site. So the feds were like, look, man, we can't keep building prisons to separate you guys. Right, so we're just opening up Lewisburg, and man, that was treacherous, man. Old ass prison, 22 hours lockdown. You know, it's, it's, it's rugged. So the first six months, you got nothing. 
some beast said with the other MMA member, you know, said, hey, you know what, check this out. That we ain't got nothing to lose. So what do we have to, you know, try to be good for or look forward to if we ain't got nothing to, you know, we ain't got nothing to lose, There's nothing to try to, you know. So a policy that if you didn't come from intake, from, you know, uh, from intake when you got off the bus and shackles to your cell, then you were going to get whacked. Meaning, you know, as soon as you get off, you got to take the team from, from, you know, from, uh, from intake right there. As soon as you get off the bus, you take your shackles off to take off on the cop, you know, because them cops, you know, they were big ass, you know, special made for that prison, big ass corn fed white boys from Pennsylvania. And so, uh, yeah, policy. So people started taking off on the cops every time the shackles came off when you're getting off the bus. And so that was because they said, look, man, you know, we got a 24 month program. We don't have nothing. Why can't we have our property? Why can't we have our books? Why can't we have this or that? And the feds were like, who the feds, man? Ain't nobody going to come in over us. You know, we'll lock you down with nothing. We'll, you know, we won't give you ever again. What are you going to do, you know? And so, you know, he said the first six months, you guys, you know, so they gave us like store like 25 bucks at first. Gave us our property, our magazine. Let us get that over time. And so we'll start taking off on the cops. Well, the first six months, it's just you, you and your cellie or whatever. And then the next phase, they wanted your, your sims because they said, look, we can't build more prisons. So, you know, we're going to open up loop and we're going to make you guys either kill each other or you guys are going to work it out. And so that's what you call their sins. So in the first week, there was like seven dead bodies because they were putting dudes in the cages. You go to the cages, you had to have a piece. You had to cut it out and go strap because them cops, what that program was established for was to put you in the cage with your enemies. So there would be two cages and you'll go and the first cage, you open it up, you step in, shut the cage, you put your hands out, they unlock it. And then you turn to the right or you turn to the left and they open another cage and it slides open. And then you walk into that cage. Boom. So you don't ever know if these cops are going to say left or right. You have your homeboys on the left or your enemies on the right. Cause you know, they, so they stopped doing that. They stopped mixing together, but it got so bad in that place that dudes were even, you know, like my home, that dude psycho that, that I, that MA dude from Pasadena, that was my neighbor for the years, he rigged out right there and choked out China boy from the MA, choked him out, his cell, he killed him and got put in a hat and got X out, but he got sent to ADX. So dudes are either killing their cellies or trying to stab a cop so they can go to ADX. ADX in Colorado's way different. That's the best place, I'd say, in the, if you're going to be in the maximum security, that's the best place to be at in the United States. You got a TV in your cell. Just hold that other place. So anyways, I'm not too old for all these years. Well, it comes 2000, what, 14 I get out. 2013, 14 I get out. Yeah, 2013 I get out. As soon as I get out, I go to the, a halfway house. And uh, I get to the halfway house, and it's me and my homeboy, Double Barrel Daryl from IE, from San Bernardino, from the ride, and he was P9. He got pulled, he got made too, you know? But anyways, uh, I won't go into that about him. Uh, we get out and we're at the halfway house in San Diego. Man, so I get to the halfway house, and uh, I was still married. Ah, hold on, let me take a drink. I was still married to my ex-wife at the time, and uh, I get there. And we split up real quick. That place right there, they breathalyze you. And it was men, women, and uh, men, women, and county, and fed. And so I get there, I got my clothes, you know, and uh, started looking for a job, started doing all that, you know. And at nighttime, you go down to the basketball court, and everybody would be there after drinking and smoking, doing all that, right? And so. We're down there, and some chick comes in with a bottle, and I just, you know, divorced my wife. I was like, what's up? So we started drinking. So my homeboy says, look, man, you know, BOP, the prisons, if they catch them back, these people are all, and I was like, who gives a 
scared about? You were scared when you were stabbing for them letters. So we're like, and we start just thinking, man, that's it. Man, they come, man, and boom, take us all, breathalyzes. As soon as they breathalyze, and, you know, they tag us for being BOP. And he says, man, the marshals are going to come in the morning. And I'm like, man, so next morning, sure, at 8 o'clock, I see the marshals coming. So I'm all packed up and got my ass packed and everything, ready to go back. <laughs> hey, and, uh. And Marshals come in, and I said, man, where you been? I've been waiting for you all morning. And they had their guns, and there was like 10 of them because it was two of us. And they get us, and they take us back, and we get to MCC, man. We blow that out, you know? Man, uh, so anyways, I go back to prison. I get uh, in a case that time out. They have, I get in a high-speed chase. I got with some chick. I got engaged. She was an RN nurse. And, uh. I just, my parole officer just put me in a, uh, uh, she said, you got to be in a halfway house. And I says, look, man, I got a badass chick with a badass pad. What do you mean I got to be in a halfway house? And she goes, you got a drug court, uh, or you got to be in a drug program, a court order for a drug program. And she goes, I don't think you would dedicate yourself to trying to look for a, a drug program uh, if you're at home with Maria and I said, uh, get, you know, so she puts me there at the halfway house and I end up getting high and I try to stir myself, you know, before I really go and my girl, we pay 500 bucks to the homeboy Blinky from East Side in San Diego. It's an essay right there. I send my love to you. I hear the fed. And, uh, uh, we go, I go to Amigo Sobrios. It's a program in San Diego, downtown. It's about 20, you get 20 beds in there, and it's a south side of the program. But I know Blinky and, you know, not two low riders at the time. And, you know, and me and Blinky go way back to when I was 17 years old, and I escaped from some uh, Camp Barrett in San Diego. Went over the fence and through the lake and everything. But anyways, I met him when I was first on my first term. And he was sober, and he owned the program and everything he got me right in there keep somebody out so i'm in that program but i already like a wolf tasted blood i already tasted some speed at that halfway house because we were fighting and so next thing you know i'm ended up doing speed well i'm getting an argument with my po and one of the counselors right there he was a black dude he did like 20 years or something he was a muslim of blood and so i'm arguing with my po and this dude's telling me get in the group and i'm like I'm talking to my PO. Well, this dude says, "Who cares?" He tried to grab my phone. Boom! I hit him and and dropped him down. You know, and so they split us up. Everybody jumped in the middle, like you know, the sober NA kind of dudes right there. Hey, you guys are good. And he told Blinky, either he goes or I go. And he acts like he goes out and he gets on the phone with some some bloods or something. Well, the homeboy Sadio from the same boys heard him and was like, "What's up, SA? You trying to?" So it turned into a thing, so I ended up leaving, and I ended up getting a high-speed chase. And uh, and I got five years in the state again for uh, felony evading, and then I got a two-year violation in the feds. And the two-year two -year violation in the feds, I got sentenced to first, because the feds, they, will, uh, they won't give you state time if they want their time. So if I... 20 years in the state, and the feds go, hey, and you owe 20 years, you know, they won't give you all concurrent time. But if you're in the feds for 20 years and the state goes, you owe us time, they'll give you that concurrent. So I got sentenced to five years and then two year violation. So I went back to the feds. And this is when it all kicked off. This is when I should have never did what I said, you know, I should have never away. So back to the feds, I get back to Victorville. I'm going to Victorville and all three of those are all both or two of those brand dudes are already dead that had those hard back in the day it's from 2003 to 2008 you know Terry Mark uh Snow so I guess Beast with sickness sickness so that kicked off that war, right? Let me go back to Victorville, that war between the whites, the skinheads, and the, you know. So everybody's in the whole. 
or SIS comes and pulls out Mark and uh, Nyquist and Terry and Snow and the skinhead leader, Jordan and Butch, and they come to agreement, you know, to, hey, man, you know, it kicked off, whatever, everybody's back. Well, so they take them around in handcuffs in the hole, and there's six ranges in Victorville. You know, you got A, B, C, you know, and uh, E, E, F on top. And back then, at that time, our range was E range up top. And you had Will Sherm right there, and Sedio was the celly, and you had a bunch of homies right there, and uh, uh, Nito and Manji, a bunch of them, you know, and, and it was all of us. And uh, Jordan, Chris Hampton, uh, Kansas, Squirrel, Sickness, uh, that whole crew right there, those are the skinheads out of like the 20, you know, because they, my homie told me, hey, there's like 20 skinheads here. He said, but, you know, they're all book Nazis. There's like seven or eight of them that get high, but those are the ones that are putting in work. The rest of them just talk about white power, and but they don't do nothing. They're one of those dudes. And so, sickness is true. Uh, Mark got up there, and I, they were right next to us. And Mark said, hey, Sickness, it's all good, homeboy. You know, it's over. Don't worry about it. And he goes, you in the brand. You stabbed me in that was in my cell, stealing shit in my cell, right? It ain't never over. So, Terry and Snow, they sat down with SIS investigations, and they told SIS, look, man, all these dudes right here, Sickness and Squirrel and Chris Hansen, all these dudes ship them out of here because if you bring them back out, we're going to kill them, right? And everybody else can go back to the yard. Happened, right? But they sat down with that investigation on, 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 on tape and did that interview or did that, you know? And so check this out. Now that's 2008. When Mark gets out, goes home, I think, and, uh, Terry goes to, with, uh, his selling term, goes to, um, um, Lewisburg, Snow too, all of us, and Lewisburg, Terry stabs the cop the fence with a big ass long rod, stabs the cop because of the program that they got us on in Lewisburg, giving us nothing, everything, uh, all the conditions that they had. They would make us go out to the yard at 5.36 in the morning in the freezing snow, right, just in our flip-flops and boxers, no shirt on, right, and leave us out there for two, three hours, you know? It's punk rock. So, uh, Terry, the cop, they sent him to ADX. So, Snow, he was in Victorville. He went back, cause in, in, in Lewisburg, you do the, you do the six months, and then you go to the next phase, two months. And then you got the, you know, the third phase, they send you in with Pennsylvania, and that, they actually, you get to go chow. They actually let you out, you know, for, you know, the first and second part of the step down program, you know? So, uh, uh, Terry went there, the ADX, and they ended up getting them on the step down program there, and they ended up killing them there. And then uh, Mark got blasted. And Snow, this is 2014, uh, I hit Victorville and Snow's there. And so as soon as I get there, they're waiting for the old man to go home. I'm not going to say his name, right? But they waited for the old man because there was about four big homies at the time right there. And so that yard flipped over. They were actually coming straight out of eight, you know, uh, that ran that yard. It was how it was ran instead of running. They said, hey, man, if somebody disrespects you, stab them. If you want to meet up on somebody, you raise whatever you do it. We'll talk about it later. Right? And you're a good white dude? Hey, and you were good right there. You know, the brand would go to bad. That's how it started. Hey, you know, the brand, you know, you know, outnumbered, it was 70% black in state prison. And so the whites, you know, they were men. And so it was just a whole different world back then. So the brand started, you know, the, the elite of the whites. Yeah, and that's how the brand started to protect the other whites, you know? And then, because the numbers, it, it united with the MA. 
you know, because blacks and the Norteños, they united, they fell, they, you know, those are their mix. So anyway, I get to Victorville, and boom, as soon as we go out, that dude Snow, he ended up getting stabbed, they butchered him over a hundred times. I know what happened, I'm not going to talk about it, but I just say this, not no names, and, you know, 